Number 67. Ephesians and Colossians in the series The Picture of God in All 66 by Graham Maxwell. Recorded May 1982. Next time, Philippians and Thessalonians. When reading Philippians for next time, of all the things in there, I'm sure you'll notice the second chapter where there's such a contrast between Satan's ambitions and Christ's amazing willingness to condescend. That's the passage where Satan says, I, well rather the Christ, who though he was God, was willing to lower himself to our level, contrast that with Satan, who though he was a mere creature, said, I will be like God, I will sit in the sides of the north, and he said to the Son of God, on your knees and worship me. The contrast in Philippians 2 is, is so eloquent. Then in Thessalonians, in those two letters, you remember the early Christians were dismayed that the Lord had not yet come before some of their relatives died. Note the way Paul chose to encourage them. And if you should have the New English Bible in your library, you might like to use that for Thessalonians. For in that difficult section on the resurrection where it says, when Christ comes, he will bring with him those who've fallen asleep. The Greek can mean either direction doesn't say bring from there here. As a matter of fact, the New English translates it, God, Christ will bring them to life with him, and there's no problem there at all. Ever since the New English Bible came out in 1961, I've always used it at funerals for that passage. It's, it's translated so well, I think, though it is an interpretation. Now let's turn to Ephesians and Colossians. Since these two are so much alike, I thought it would be useful to do them together at the same time. When you look at Ephesians, does your version say that this letter was sent to Ephesus? Yes and no. Interesting, isn't it? Well, look at chapter 3, verse 2, as to why the question has ever been raised about whether or not it went to Ephesus. Chapter 3, verse 2. Assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, to the saints in Ephesus, he'd spent three years there. And so some have wondered if this could have gone directly to Ephesus. Moreover, how about the greetings at the end? They're not there. He had maybe more friends there than anywhere else. Um, one notable scholar who questioned whether this first went to Ephesians was Goodspeed. He says this must have been an encyclical designed to go many places or it would have greetings to the saints in Ephesus and it wouldn't have chapter 3 verse 2. So he argued that it was an encyclical, a general letter, but since Ephesus was the publication center for the early Christian church and the letter did indeed go there for distribution, it became known as the letter to the Ephesians. In the early 1930s, the earliest manuscripts of... Uh, the New Testament books began to come to light, some brittle papyri, some known as the Chester Beatty papyri. One numbered P46, P for papyri, came to uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Goodspeed was teaching at the University of Chicago. And when it arrived, he traveled that short distance from Chicago to Ann Arbor, wondering if this manuscript would confirm what he had uh, risked his reputation to uh, present in his book. And when he got there, looked at P46, there was no N of Fessel. And that really corroborated his view. And that's why some versions don't have in Ephesus, just as to the saints who are also faithful. However, I noticed that some very modern versions with the best of scholarship have put Ephesians back in at Ephesus. How's today's English? Do you have uh, in Ephesus in yours? It, they put it in, and that's a scholarly version. How about the New International Version, NIV? It doesn't have it. Well, there's, there's no um, skullduggery going on here. This is what's behind the, the question as to whether to put it in or not. Yes? I was just wondering if there in verse 15, is that truly a past tense, or it says, I heard that you were wonderfully taken care of. I heard it, he says, as if I'd never been there myself, but here's what I've heard. Oh, mine says, I have heard. Uh, and I'm still hearing, maybe. Uh, after three years, would have known it. Wouldn't have had to hear it from someone else. He'd surely know, wouldn't he? I'd think that would be part of the evidence, wouldn't it? I think so. Well, that's good speed. The basis for his argument there, and I, I, I think he's probably right. 
Although, what difference would it make to our understanding of the book? Not the slightest. It's just to help us understand why there are differences in the version sometimes. Now, it's clearly from Rome, and he's in prison. Chapter 3, verse 1, Paul, a prisoner. 4, verse 1, a prisoner. 6.20, an ambassador in chains. Did you notice that Colossians is also a prison epistle? Did you notice in Colossians 4.3, on account of which I am in prison, and then 4.18, remember my fetters, and there are some other places, in 4.10, my fellow prisoner, Aristarchus. And so these are called prison epistles. There are more than this, but these are two of them. Now this letter was directed to Colossae, and as you remember your geography of that part of the world, there were three cities close together, Colossae, Laodicea, and Hierapolis, and they're all mentioned. In chapter 2, verse 1 of Colossians, he mentions Laodicea. I want you to know how greatly I strive for you and for those at Laodicea. Do you remember those three, like the twin cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis? There were three there in a little triangle. And then if you look at 4.13, he mentions Laodicea and Hierapolis. All three. But right next door to that, in verse 16 of Colossians 4, he mentions a letter we may or may not have. When this letter, that is the letter to the Colossians, has been read among you there in Colossae, have it read also in the church of the Laodiceans nearby, and see that you read also the letter from Laodicea. Where's that one? Well, that's one theory. That is one theory. Um, th this is really speculation and interesting to think about. The next line says, And say to Archippus, See that you fulfill the ministry which you have received in the Lord. Have we ever heard of Archippus before? Well, not in this reading through, but uh, had we read Philemon already, you notice in Philemon, you hardly need to say Philemon chapter 1. There is only one. But then if you say Philemon 2, people wonder if there's two chapters. Philemon verse 2. addresses Archippus, Archippus, our fellow soldier, suggesting that maybe Archippus was the pastor of the church where Philemon lived, who owned the slave Onesimus, who was sent home with that extraordinary letter of introduction that might have saved his life. And so some wonder if maybe, maybe Philemon is the letter to Laodicea. Nobody knows for sure, and it won't affect the meaning, but uh, it's, it's fun to wonder. Well, these two letters are so similar, Ephesians and Colossians. What impressed you most with these two? Let me one, mention one thing for a start. I think the most important thing in reading the Bible is to have read the book of Revelation before reading the other 65. That's a privilege we have that the early Christians didn't have. Uh, the generation that knew the apostles was all gone by then. Revelation written in the 90s, only John left. And John was given this larger view of the war up in heaven and that uh, our predicament is just part of a much larger one. And to see that larger view makes so much greater sense and significance out of everything else we read in the Bible. Are there intimations before Revelation, though, of the larger involvement? Well, look in Ephesians. 1.9, for example. What did the audience that first heard this letter read as a whole? How did they react to these words? He has made known to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will, according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. That raises one's sights above just what's going on on this earth. Now, if you've read Revelation, you know there was a war up in heaven. And that's not unity. That's war. That's division. That's hostility. And God is purposing to unite all things. 
Though when you read the book of Revelation, you realize he fails to win a great many of his children to reunite, and he has to let them go. But his goal is unity. Then look also at 3.7 in Ephesians. Ephesians 3.7. Since you've read both these books, it isn't such a risk to take something right out of the middle. You remember the preambles to this. Of this gospel, this good news, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints. Is that true? Or is that just an expression of modesty? This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make all men see... Understand, what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, that through the church, and how, how widely are we to understand that word church, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now, where are those? This was according to the eternal purpose which he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, which reminds us of the first of the three angels' messages in Romans and Revelation 14, which speaks of the eternal, everlasting good news. The gospel has always been true, always will be, and it involves, I think, a much larger sphere and scope than, than we sometimes envision. It involves the whole universe. But then add to this Colossians 1, Colossians 1 for a similar Larger picture of things. Colossians 1, oh, let's start, say, with 15. <clears throat> he is the image of the invisible God, and you know the preamble up to this point identifies who this is, of course. The firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent for. In him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross, suggesting that Jesus died for the rest of the universe too, even for loyal angels. And we know after the war of Revelation 12, uh, the opposition was cast down to this earth to continue the war down here in which we've become so personally involved. Now, to make peace is to bring about unity, harmony, reconciliation. The one who came was fully God, and his goal was to restore peace and unity in the universe in which there has been war. Now, it was on the basis of verses like these and the picture in Revelation that Ellen White adopted this larger view for all her writings, which puzzles many, to be sure. And some wonder if it's biblical. I see it running all the way through. And you know this familiar quotation. The plan of redemption had a yet broader and deeper purpose than the salvation of man. It was not for this alone that Christ came to the earth. It was not merely that the inhabitants of this little world might regard the law of God as it should be regarded, but it was to vindicate the character of God before the universe. He'd been charged and accused before the universe. That's where the war started. To this result of his great sacrifice, that is, its influence upon the intelligences of other worlds, as well as upon man, the Savior looked forward when just before his crucifixion he said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. Now, in the King James, it says all men, men in italics, meaning it was supplied by the very honest committee. They were so conscientious. There were times when they almost didn't need to put words in, in italics, but later on, uh, more and more words were put in italics to show how the committee and the later revisers of the King James did not want to mislead the reader. Now, the word all is in the masculine gender, to be sure. And so you could have all men. And that would include all women, you would understand. But how about all the angels and the rest? 
So since the word men isn't in there, it does leave room for everybody, angels and men, principalities and powers in the heavenly places. And Ellen White had the insight and the courage to drop the word in italics. She has, I will draw all unto me. And yet, whenever that passage in Patriarchs and Prophets 68 and 69 is quoted in our papers, the uh, copy editors and the proofreaders conscientiously put the word men back in and miss the point. Because if you read the next sentence, you can see she means more than men, as Paul does. For look at the next line in the quotation. The act of Christ in dying for the salvation of man would not only make heaven accessible to men, but before all the universe. That's the whole point. I'll draw all unto me. It would justify God and his son in their dealing with the rebellion of Satan. It would establish the perpetuity of the law of God. And that is indeed the subject and the problem raised in Ephesians and Colossians and Galatians. And it would reveal the nature and the results of sin. Now that's an oft-quoted paragraph. Here's one that is very rarely quoted because it's in the Signs of the Times reprints. December 22, 1914. Look at this insight, just before Ellen White died. Through the plan of salvation, a larger purpose is to be wrought out even than the salvation of man and the redemption of the earth. Through the revelation of the character of God in Christ. Doesn't that fit in our Colossians here? The beneficence of the divine government would be manifested before the universe. I mean, if all God's law asks of us is love and mutual trust and trustworthiness, I mean, isn't that a beneficent government? How about God's government envisioning our complete recovery of self-control? I mean, that's beneficent government. Also, the charge of Satan would be refuted that God is arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, unforgiving, and severe. The nature and result of sin would be made plain. Isn't that what the cross has revealed to us? The way Jesus died. And the perpetuity of the law would be fully demonstrated. That's a, a most succinct statement, seems to me, of the whole larger view of things. That's Signs of the Times, December 22, 1914. Hopefully you all possess those reprints. But now, in the light of all this, how about Ephesians 2.14? Maybe the very heart of Ephesians, certainly as far as the questions about the beneficence of God's government, the perpetuity of his law, and whether or not we're really free when we come to know the truth about God. Ephesians 2.14. Now, if by mistake you opened at Colossians 2.14, it will read very much like this, doesn't it? You remember how similar those are? Ephesians 2.14. For he is our peace. There we go again. He has brought peace who has made us both one, that's unity, and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. You see, um, when hostilities end in the Falklands, there'll be peace. Well, I hope so. <laughs> Maybe it'll take a little while. By abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and ordinances. You mean if we abolish the law, then we'll have more love, more peace? If we do away with the law? No, we say this is only one of the laws, not all of them. That he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, and so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby bringing the hostility to, to an end. Hostility between whom? Well, now what law is that? You see, he, he abolished the law of commandments and ordinances to make for peace. Is not the Jewish addition to, uh, to the writings of Moses that they uh, yeah. circulated and promulgated for centuries? This is what Jesus ended at the cross. Yeah. The stranglehold, stranglehold on the, the Jewish and the Gentile mind Yes. was to be released by the realization yes. that all of these additions to the teachings of Moses uh, had no place in the Christian church. Now, you're not suggesting then that uh, the Ten Commandments is el are eliminated here? No, only the and additions to the writings of Moses and the Ten yes. Commandments. And you're not suggesting that it's the law of ceremonies and, and rituals and so on? 
Well, only insofar as they yes. pointed forward to Christ. But that, but there's much more involved in here than just the the uh, sacrifices that pertain to Christ. Would you mean then that the sacrifices that pointed forward to Christ had been a cause of hostility? No, they were the gospel. Then. What had Moses ever given that was a cause of hostility? Nothing. It's all so this doesn't include any law in the Old Testament? No. Now how about in Galatians last time, the law was added because of transgression to bring us to Christ. Now what laws are those? The, the Ten Commandments. Would that be everything in the Bible? Yes. So the law that was added to bring us to Christ, but now that we've come to Christ, we're no longer under that custodian. Those would be all the laws you do find in the Old Testament. But the laws that are done away with here are all the laws that the Jews wrote that were not in the Old Testament. Now, how about when we get over to Colossians 2.14, what was nailed to the cross? The offerings of his own sacrifice were nailed to the cross because he ended as the Lamb of God that had been slain from the foundation of the world. Well, now, it makes the observation here in Colossians 2.14. Now, the version we have is going to make such a difference. How to settle all these things at once. Um, well, in the King James, it says, the handwriting of ordinances, which was contrary to us, which was against us. He took it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. And having nailed this to the cross, he says, let no one pass judgment on you any longer in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now this seems to be the same thing ending here that's ending in Ephesians 2. Now if what is ending in Ephesians 2 is all the laws that were added that were not in the Old Testament, is he referring here only to the laws that were added that were not in the Old Testament, then how would we explain the reference to new moon, Sabbath, questions of food and drink? The, the apostles uh, had to have clarified in their uh, beginning of the new Christian church how much of the Jewish teachings could be and would be and should be incorporated in the Christian church. So Peter got his uh, uh, part straightened out in chapter 10 of Acts. Yes. And uh, from time to time these different things that uh, were still lingering in the minds of many of the Jewish converts, mm -hmm. uh, still uh, vestigial remnants of yes. <laughs> our, their ancestors' yes. teachings, uh, must must be eliminated. Yes. And the Christians were going to be free in the New Testament from all of that ancient Jewish uh, conglomerate <laughs> detail and yes. trivia that had to be their interpretations of all the writings of Paul. Let's see how others agree with you on that. Yeah, what do you think? Um, in the context, in the in uh, we started um, in Colossians yes. at verse 14, but in the context leading up to them, say verse, verse 8, it says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Mm -hmm. So in, in a sense, at least partially, if we take the whole thing into context, mm -hmm. that would seem to, to fit in quite well, at least in Colossians. Paul was continually yes. being uh, badgered by these half-converted <laughs> Christians from Judaism. Let's try this, though, in that light. Let's start back in Ephesians 2.11 and um, have more of the experience of the group who heard this read out loud. You know, it's just so essential. Because what they've heard up to this point is going to influence their interpretation of the law and the ordinances and so on that follow. Let's start with Ephesians 2.11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands, now is circumcision in the Old Testament or in writings outside the Old Testament? It's in the Old Testament. The issue of circumcision, was it not a cause of much misunderstanding and hostility and estrangement? Jews wouldn't even associate with Gentiles. And you remember when Titus was brought by Paul. They had to spy and see if he really belonged in the group. I mean, that makes for suspicion and hostility. Is it so much what had been written outside, though a lot was written outside in support of that, but was it also a misunderstanding of what was written inside the Old Testament as well? You see, where did they get the misunderstanding of circumcision? 
Were there written misunderstandings of circumcision? Or could you take the regulations right out of the Old Testament and do this thing in your head? Is it possible even to take the seventh day Sabbath and misunderstand it and turn it into a, a dividing thing rather than a uniting thing? Could it be both? And you said both in a way. Their misunderstanding of what God had given, written or unwritten, and a lot was written. Remember we read from the Mishnah. It, so in a way we could maybe simplify and say that what was taken away was the misunderstanding, perhaps. Let's read though and see if, if we can agree. Verse 11, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, you uncircumcised people, alienated. See, here are words for hostility and disunity and separation. Alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near in the blood of Christ. Oh, aren't these loaded phrases to be interpreted carefully? What difference does that make? For he is our peace. His goal is the reunifying of the family, not just on this planet, but throughout the universe, if possible, who has made us both one. Remember Jesus' prayer, I pray you all may be one. As I and the Father are one, I pray you all may be one. And has broken down the dividing wall of hostility. Now, was there not a dividing wall of hostility even in heaven among the angels? And what was the issue? Has it always been over God's law? Is it the fault of the law or a misunderstanding of the law? Hasn't God's law been misunderstood as the arbitrary demand of an, of an exacting, unforgiving, and vengeful deity? A complete misunderstanding of it, and especially the Sabbath been misunderstood. The basis of alienation of the angels yes. in heaven. He took the law and twisted it. Indeed so. By abolishing in his flesh the law of commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby bringing hostility to an end. And he came and preached peace, you notice. How can you have peace if you suspect your leader of being an arbitrary tyrant? To you who are far off, and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. He's the Father of us all. So then you are no longer strangers and sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. And it's very interesting, when you get to Philippians 3, next time, Philippians 3.20, do note in your version, King James, our conversation is in heaven, which is a good key text for a dormitory dean who thinks the boys uh, need to take their language more seriously. But that's not the point at all. The Greek word is polichima, from which we actually get politics, but it means citizenship. And your version may well say, for our citizenship is in heaven. You see, we may be citizens of different lands. Um, believers in Argentina and believers in the British Isles are all citizens of the same kingdom, you see. Well, isn't it amazing when the war was all over, Christians got together as before. I, I was talking to two Japanese students the other day in class. Will you think how we felt about each other some years ago? But um, Christians went on communicating and being friends through it all. It was a terrible dilemma to be in. Um, I think if the people were all left alone, they'd all be friends of the world around. Just because some demented leaders make terrible mistakes, friends are turned against friends. Well, we're all citizens of the same country. You are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. By the way, is the church built on Peter? If you say no, then you're going to have to say, built upon the foundation of all the apostles except Peter. And then it is all right. You see, if one of our Catholic friends says, do you believe the church is built upon Peter? Rather than argue with that, I'd say, by all means. He just didn't carry the whole load. The prophets even helped too. And if you uh, are looking for a church that builds its beliefs and practices upon the teachings of the apostles and the prophets, guess who will be the chief cornerstone? The name of Jesus Christ. So I like to use Ephesians 2.20 with Matthew 16.18 when answering that question. In whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built into it for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now maybe we should... Compare with this Colossians 
directly, instead of going on with things in Ephesians for a moment, because it's so similar. It, it may be that the folk in Colossae may have compared notes with the folk in Ephesus um, to see if one letter would help the other. Colossians 2.14, but one can hardly start there. Why don't you go back to uh, verse 8, Colossians 2.8, and you'll notice he's dealing with the same sort of a problem. See to it that no one makes a prey of you by philosophy and empty deceit. His audience is a little different here. There are some more references to philosophy here and, and some mysterious things that suggest the beliefs of the Gnostics, as they were called. An empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe, whatever those are, and not according to Christ, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have come to fullness of life in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. Remember, Paul talks about people who are, are, have their hearts circumcised. And you were buried with him in baptism. Hmm, sounds like Romans 6. Isn't there a similarity among all these letters? These letters? In which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses and having... I'll use the Revised Standard. Cancelled the bond which stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in him. Now in view of his having nailed whatever this is to the cross, therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, taking his stand on visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the universe, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things which all perish as they are used, according to human precepts and doctrines? These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting rigor of devotion and self-abasement and severity to the body, but they are of little value in checking the indulgences of the flesh. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, and so on. Now, what, what did he nail to the cross? That would be the most pointed thing to deal with here, and you know it's been much debated. Ephesians and Colossians both say that when he died... He did something that was designed to bring peace and unity to the whole universe, as well as on this planet. Something ended at that time. Yes, uh, of all of them I read, I think I read everyone I could find, and the one I, I think I like the best, whether it fits the best or not, it, and it says, and blotted out the charges proved against you, the list of the commandments which you had not obeyed. He took the list of sins and destroyed it by nailing it to his cross. Well, what version is that? That's the uh, uh, Living Bible. What would you judge then was nailed to the cross from the Living Bible? Our indebtedness, the sins that we've committed that could not be forgiven. Mm -hmm. Why couldn't they be forgiven? Back to the blood of Christ again. They yes. were an offense against us, and the only way they could be removed was by his sacrifice. By his deed, God had already set that in motion. That's part of the original plan. Christ had to come in the fullness of time in order to form this. Yeah, now, the, the translation in the Living Bible of the word that the King James translates handwriting of ordinances, could you pick out just that much? He paraphrases it so. The list of his commandments, I guess. 
ordinances. That's the second part. That's the ordinances. What's the first part? Charges proved against us. Yes. I think that's the handwriting. Anybody have anything like that? What do you have? Well, I was just going to comment. Mm -hmm. um, in Ephesians, before he gets into the Law of Commandments, it says it abolished in his flesh the enmity, yes. which goes back even further than, uh, than say, the Ten Commandments, the, yes. at least the, having to do with uh, <coughs> the original sin and the, uh, and the uh, enmity between God and man, rather than just between man and, and the And law. yet the law is related to this subject of enmity and hostility. And yet when we read the law in Galatians, all it asks for is love. And how could love bring enmity, is the question. But the background of the Jewish uh, people regarding the Gentiles as dogs yes. and not worthy of salvation, which was been traditional since the return from Babylon, uh, Paul is talking here about uh, the fulfillment of John 17, prayer of the Lord, that they would be united in one, both Jew and Gentile, as far as this... Uh, ministry of his because he was intermingling and commingling with Jews and Gentiles and endeavoring to do everything within his power to bring a few Jews together and have them reconciled to their brethren which he had been teaching things that uh, the Jews no longer needed to practice and neither did the Gentiles. But now this uh, talks about bringing peace in, in the heavenly places too. This would, of course would be ultimately yes. in, in, in heaven but right locally it would be his his ultimate objective to bring uh, you Jews and Gentiles together in one piece because uh, the Gentiles recognized that they had been regarded in such an infamous way in the past and were, might be suspicious of what the Jews would be like under Christianity. So what had to be nailed to the cross to make this possible? Was that what had to be nailed to the cross to make the, this possible? The Jewish traditions. He took all the Jewish traditions and nailed them to the cross. They, they no longer had any part in the in How would the that make Christian peace among, among the angels? How would that bring reunification throughout the universe? Well, the teachings of man on the earth yes. may have been distorted yes. from what the angels already knew. In the same terms. I mean, the same enemy who started the war is the one who's been deceiving us into similar misunderstandings of God, is what I derive from what you're saying, right? Would that be true? Yes. In the Good News Bible, it says this, that he abolished the Jewish law with its commandments and rules yes. in order to create out of the two races, and I assume that's yes. Jews and Gentiles, yes. a single new people in union with himself, yes. thus making peace. Now, what do you think that version means by the Jewish law? Possibly a thought on this might be you can't legislate commandments and rules to make peace, gain peace. Yes doesn't make peace. Is that the end of the Ten Commandments? Well, is this referring to it? It's not the Jewish law. That's the law. The Jewish law? law? This is the Jewish what law. did that version consider the Jewish law to be? What would the average law. reader think if when you read on, therefore let no one judge you anymore with respect to a Sabbath? This is the transition of the Jewish believers bringing it into the Gentile church. How can you show the Ten Commandments still have authority after all this? Because they were given before the Jews. For the word Jews. And yet he said in Galatians the law was added. This was to deal with the problem of sin yes. and to make sin all the more sinful yes. to magnify the grace of God to deal yes. with the with sinful condition in these yes. uh, reprobates. Yes. What do you think? Well, you mentioned the Sabbath, is, and uh, the King James says of the Sabbath days. Yes. The different Sabbaths that the Jews had. Can you not tell it's seven, those and not the not seventh the day? Seventh, not the seventh day. Sabbath. How could you tell? Pardon? How could you tell it doesn't include the seventh day? It says of the seventh of the Sabbath days. See? Now, if they were if they, they were going to talk about the Sabbath day, the seventh day Sabbath, then they wouldn't have said days. The NIV says day. But the, yes, but some then, have day, some have days. In Leviticus, it says that these uh, seven annual Sabbaths were besides mm -hmm. the Sabbath of the Lord. <laughs> Yes. The Sabbath of the Lord in Leviticus mm -hmm. is distinguished from these annual Sabbaths. Yeah. And that's made, that's made very clear. And then we have the ringing in the back of our heads, Paul's comments in Romans 14. One man esteems one day above another. Another man esteems all days alike. Let everyone be fully persuaded in his own mind, and who are you to judge and condemn another? 
You see, we'd have to beware lest we read Colossians 2.16 like this. Therefore let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or one of the ceremonial Sabbaths, but when it comes to the seventh day Sabbath, you can judge and condemn there. That's perfectly all right. And we've got the hostility back. We don't have peace. When there's condemnation of others, or there's judging of others, there's no peace. In Romans, you remember we discussed that. One man esteems one day above another, another man esteems all days alike. Let everyone be fully persuaded in his own mind. And we sometimes say, now that can't include the seventh day Sabbath because you're not free to be persuaded in your own mind on that. <laughs> you know, you have to do it anyway. And you remember the rest of Romans 14 is, who are you to judge another? We'll give account of ourselves to God. And you say, well, don't judge people regarding ceremonial Sabbaths. But when it comes to the seventh-day Sabbath, if they don't keep it, you can judge them all you like. But then you've got hostility, and that's what happens. Are Sabbath keepers free to condemn anybody? For 39 years, the, the Christian church had a commingling yes. of believers on both sides. Yes. Paul was trying to play down, low-key, the, the relationship yes. between the Jew, uh, Jewish viewpoint that they still clung to, because Paul said that they have Moses read to them every day in the Sabbath for 39 years. Uh, all of the writings of Moses was read as if they were still in effect with respect to the sacrifices uh, that Christ ended on the cross. So he was, uh, yes. he was playing it uh, as cool as he could between the two. Which caused greater hostility, ceremonial Sabbaths or the Seventh-day Sabbath? The Seventh-day Sabbath stood out pretty clear. As, as, as Everybody as understood point. clearly how to observe it? And what attitude to have toward it? How about crucifying Christ and rushing home to keep Sabbath? Did they have the remotest idea what the Sabbath was about? Well, maybe this might be safe to do. Should we agree on what was nailed to the cross, perhaps? Yes. With persistent timidity, I'll bring up one more. <laughs> That's good. Go on. The commentary tells us that this is all three of the laws of Moses Go on. being handled here. Yes. Now, why are we so afraid of yes. what we're doing in the last 15 minutes? Yes. If that's true, then we should be able to defend our position without any hesitation. Yes. And happily so. What do you think about that? Oh, Dr. John. What's that word bond really mean? In the, the Greek word is a very interesting one, and it's the source of the handwriting. That's just a literal translation. It doesn't really tell us what the meaning is. What was nailed to the cross is pronounced hierographon, C-H-E-I-R-O-G-R-A-P-H-O-N. Now, graphon, you can see graphite or telegraphy, photography, calligraphy. Graph is right. And the first part, C-H-E-I-R, is the source, interestingly enough, of the word surgeon, the word chiropodist, who is now a podiatrist, isn't he? <laughs> or a chiropractor. Isn't it rather interesting? They're all the same. C-H-E-I-R is hand. So it means literally handwriting, but that doesn't tell us what the word means. We have to find how they used it. And so we look all through the Bible to see if anybody else used it. And if you have a Protestant Bible, no. If you have a Roman Catholic version, yes. For in the Apocrypha, in the book of Tobit, there are... T there are um, Several references to this word, and the story there tells of how Tobias took some money, went to visit his relatives, to make it very brief, left with them his money, and they gave him in return a chirographon, a handwriting. Later on, he wanted his money, he went to see them, he gave them the handwriting, and they gave him his money back. Then what's a handwriting? Note. What's a chirographon? It's a note. It's a bond, it's an agreement, it's a receipt. Now, sometimes we have argued the handwriting of ordinances must be, well, it couldn't be the Ten Commandments because they were written with the finger of God, I read once. But Moses wrote the rest, and so this must be the law of Moses which was put in the side of the ark. And so this would be the ceremonial law. And so many have happily nailed the ceremonial law to the cross and thereby have been relieved to save the Ten Commandments. But some argued the same way in Galatians, you know. The law was added to bring us to Christ. What law was added? You remember the argument? Was it the ceremonial? Was it the moral? And, and some said at some risk to their um, 
a reputation for orthodoxy, it was both. And then Ellen White said, absolutely it's both. And if it's one above another, it's the Ten Commandments. But here, she says, it was not the Ten Commandments nailed to the cross, it was the ceremonial law because of the emphasis on the ordinances. Well, the handwriting of ordinances, let's think about that. Let's say that is the ceremonial law. Was it ever against us? What was the ceremonial law given to teach? The yes, the gospel, isn't it? The, that salvation is by faith in the one to come. So it never was against us. Well, in the Greek it doesn't say the ordinances were against us. It says he took away the handwriting, that is the bond, which was against us, and he took it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. And in the Greek the it is not only singular, but it's neuter gender, the gender of the handwriting. In other words, the bond was against us. The broken agreement was against us. All that the Lord hath said we will do, they boldly said at the foot of Sinai, and 40 days later they were dancing around the golden calf. They kept breaking that agreement. We've all broken that agreement. We're all guilty of sin, which is a breach of trust. And that has stood against us. Jesus took this that was against us and nailed it to the cross. Of course, when the bond was nailed to the cross, was there any further need for all the ceremonies and types that pointed forward to the day when he would nail it to the cross? So, of course, the ceremonial law came to its end, just naturally, when he came to fulfill all that it anticipated. But don't put the nail through the ceremonial law. The nail goes through that sentence, that, that broken agreement. That's what he nailed to the cross, and hanging from it in small print were all the ceremonies. Now, the Ten Commandments, were they terminated at the cross? That is, the law of love, was it terminated at the cross? Well, there's no peace without love. There's no unity. What's the opposite of hostility anyway? But love, God has always been for love. There's just that problem of the Sabbath, which seems ceremonial, you see. And then the mention of the Sabbath a little later. To some, they say, you can't make those distinctions. You just want to preserve the seventh-day Sabbath. How crucial, then, we have some approach to the Sabbath that does not violate the whole spirit of this thing. And if our observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath is still a cause of disunity and hostility and alienation, then it is not serving its original purpose. How can the Sabbath unite rather than divide? Well, it all depends how it's approached. Could we, since we don't have time now to just go slowly through these sections, we have both these books, would it seem apparent that there was some serious misunderstanding of God's legal provisions through the years? That um, Christ changes, seeks to correct. Whether it's in Galatians, the law was added to bring us to Christ. Now that we've come to Christ and we trust him and are willing to listen, we're no longer under this custodian. Now, whatever it was here, and God graciously gave us these laws, he added them. He added them to God and protect us and to point forward to this occasion when Christ would do what was required to make for peace. There's apparently been some misunderstanding of all of this uh, provision, of all these laws that comes to an end at this time. And it seems to me that one of the greatest misunderstandings that comes to its end when you look at the cross and understand its meaning is the misunderstanding that fulfilling all the requirements of those laws somehow took care of that broken agreement. All the killing of those animals took care of the broken agreement? You mean the blood of bulls and goats took care of it? Or the keeping of Sabbath wins God's favor? Or abstinence from this, that, or the other? None of those things wins his favor. We already had it. He loves his children, and because we needed it, he added provision after provision after provision, and we made the awful mistake of misunderstanding the whole purpose of those things. Actually, God says, I wish I didn't have to give you these at all. And I know I've run a risk in giving you all these rules and regulations that you'll misunderstand the purpose and just obey the rules without any thought as to their meaning. And the ultimate demonstration of the hazard of misunderstanding all of God's legal provisions was shown on Crucifixion Friday when they were so careful to keep the seventh-day Sabbath that they worried that their Lord on the cross would not die in time for them to get him buried and everything tidy for Sabbath. I mean, the insanity of that. But they wanted to obey that law, you know, along with all the rest. The Sabbath, which I believe was designed to remind us of all the truth that sets us free, has been the most perverted of the lot. 
and has become such an, uh, an expression of arbitrariness on God's part and ours. I even read recently, the beauty of the Sabbath lies in its total arbitrariness. No reasons for it, just except he said do it. And it's a beautiful test of our obedience because we can't think of any other reason than that he told us to do it. And I show I'm his true son by doing what I'm told. Uh, that can breed the wrong spirit. So uh, at least would it seem apparent that the cross, which was designed to make peace throughout the universe, we read, and bring unity again, an end to the war, brings to an end a misunderstanding of these legal matters through the years. Could we include anything and everything in that, as far as that's concerned? Or are there some things you could leave out and say, now you can be legalistic about some things. That is, you can be judgmental about some things. You can condemn people if they disagree with you about some things. Well, Alan White is so eloquent on that. Look at this. The effort to earn salvation by one's own works. Now, wouldn't that be doing all the things that the rules require? To please God. Instead of realizing the rules were given to protect and guide us back to God or until Christ should come and give us the real motivation. The effort to earn salvation by one's own works inevitably leads men to pile up human exactions as a barrier against sin, and that would be all things they wrote in addition that you've mentioned. For seeing that they fail to keep the law, they will devise rules and regulations of their own to force themselves to obey. All of this turns the mind away from God to self. But all the laws were added to lead us back to God. And yet if we're just obeying the rules, that will lead us away from God. His love dies out of the heart, and with it perishes love for his fellow men. Paul says, when I read that 10th commandment, God's love died out of my heart. I thought I was doing pretty well till I read number 10, and it says I not only mustn't do anything wrong, I mustn't even want to. He said, that really irritated me. And I didn't love the one who'd pry within me so deeply and say, you haven't done that well because you actually wanted to do it. A system of human invention with its multitudinous exactions will lead its advocates to judge all who come short of the prescribed human standard. See, if you've got a blueprint that lists every little detail, then you know when your neighbors are doing right or wrong. The atmosphere of selfish and narrow criticism stifles the noble and generous emotions and causes men to become self-centered judges and petty spies like the members of that committee who were assigned to find out if Titus had been circumcised. How would you like to be on that committee? <laughs> the Pharisees were of this class. They came forth from their religious services, not humbled with a sense of their own weakness, not grateful for the great privileges that God had given them. They came forth filled with spiritual pride, and their theme was, myself, my feelings, my knowledge, my ways. Their own attainments became the standard by which they judged others. Putting on the robes of self-dignity, they mounted the judgment seat to criticize and condemn. The people partook largely of the same spirit, intruding upon the province of conscience and judging one another in matters that lay between the soul and God. Can you hear Paul saying, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind? It was in reference to this spirit and practice that Jesus said, Judge not that ye be not judged. And Paul said, Who are you to judge another? It's no business of yours. That is, do not set yourself up as a standard. Do not make your opinions, your views of duty, your interpretations of Scripture even, a criterion for others. And in your heart condemn them if they do not come up to your ideal. But of course, if they don't keep the seventh day Sabbath, you can condemn them. There's, there's no exception here at all, is there? And that's the end of hostility. Do not criticize others, conjecturing as to their motives. You've just seen Hosea looking for his wife when she went back to town to take up her former life of prostitution. And he's looking for his wife. God had said, go look for your wife. Take money. See if you can buy her back. He ran a risk, you know, that some would conjecture as to his motives and passing judgment upon them. Isn't it a relief not to have to do it anymore? Well, but uh, God will do it, won't he? Remember John 3 and John 12? I don't condemn anybody. I haven't come to judge anybody, and I won't in the end, John 3 and John 12 say. Oh, there'll be something to judge you, 
My word, the truth will judge you. Have you responded to the truth? Have you been won back to trust and faith? If so, we'll have been able to heal you and you'll be safe to say. If you have not responded to truth, I won't need to condemn you. You will have condemned yourself already because you will not have been won back to trust. I will not have been able to heal you. And I will say of you, let him that is filthy stay that way. That's all. John 3 and John 12. So this is for grown-ups, to be sure, this kind of talk. But it's God's ideal for us. As a matter of fact, Ephesians 4 has a lot to say about this being the behavior of grown-ups. And that if we really understand the message of the cross and have come to admire God for this, amazed that he would be willing to pay such a price to clarify all of this about himself and his government. It would help us to grow up a great deal in our treatment of other people. In Ephesians 4, he talks about the whole purpose of the church. Start with 11, say. His gifts were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipment of the saints, for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. That's the church the whole church, until we all attain to the unity. Now, isn't that the subject of Ephesians and Colossians and other places? He wants to bring unity in the family. He wants to make for peace and an end to hostility. All right, until we all attain to the unity that is made possible by the tightly cinched bailing wire of rules and regulations and a fear of final judgment and torment. That's no unity at all, is it? It says, until we all attain, now the versions vary. Mine, the Revised Standard says, to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. The unity of the faith, what's that? Now some would say that they all believe the same thing. <clears throat> they have the creed and they all subscribe to it. We had to tie a few to the stake and burn a few, but now we have unity. That's no good either, is it? So I love, I think it's the New English Bible has, the unity inherent in our faith. Or Do you, do you have that in anyone? That would be my preference. Yes, I have. Oh, what, what version? New English. It is New English? Mm -hmm. The unity inherent in our faith mm -hmm. and our knowledge of the Son of God. That is, we now know the truth about our God is revealed by his Son, and we like it, and it has won us back to trust and faith. In other words, we all love, trust, admire, and worship the same God. Now, well, that makes for unity, doesn't it? Because what is it about God that has won us? Isn't it that he, he values nothing higher than our freedom, and all the laws he's given were just for our protection, and he, and he almost apologizes every time he gives us a law. It is fraught with hazard that we'll misunderstand and do these things for the wrong reason. I mean, God isn't pleased when I abstain from murdering my mother-in-law because every day I check that law and it says, Thou shalt not do it, and if thou doest, thou shalt be seriously punished in the end, and so I don't murder my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law is not that secure under those circumstances because one day I might forget to read the, the rules that morning. The Lord's goal is that sometimes, someday we come to the place where we never think of murdering our mothers-in-law. Of course, they'll be wonderful ladies, too. I can say this safely. I never met my mother-in-law. And I'm very sorry to say she died just before I met my wife-to-be. From what I hear, I'd like to have met her very much. But God does not want the citizens of the hereafter to be safe because we read the rules and we take the rule giver very seriously. That's not real unity. That's not the Tenth Commandment which says, Thou shalt not even want to murder thy mother-in-law. And that's the law written in the heart, where a man does his thinking as well as his feeling. So this is not a contrived, enforced unity. Here are people who, in the highest sense of freedom, have agreed that God is not the kind of person his enemies have made him out to be. He is instead precisely as Jesus revealed him to be. And we accept his testimony that if we've seen Jesus, we've seen the Father. He does value nothing higher than our freedom. He hates to add law upon law. He'd rather we do what's right because it is right. Ah, and that adds dignity to life. That's what we all want. Wouldn't you love to live under that kind of a government? A government that does not like to add laws or rule by law at all. Of course, it does mean that God can only admit to his kingdom those who respect 
this quality of life. So, he says, I, I cannot save you if you do not like this. Besides, if you want to go some other way, the consequences are serious even in this life. The, the results are very damaging. Well, but do you notice after mentioning this kind of unity, what kind of people would respect this kind of unity? Look at the next line. And reach mature manhood, mature personhood. This is the way grown-ups behave. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, be grown up as he was, so that, to make his point more emphatic, we may no longer be children. Remember in 1 Corinthians 13, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I behaved as a child. But now that I've grown up, I behave, as 1 Corinthians 13 says. A grown-up person loves and is never rude and never arrogant and never insists on having his own way and never impatient and so on. That's the way grown-ups behave. And there's peace in that kind of a community. So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine there's no stability in the family when every person that comes by with some new idea can, um, can confuse the family. Satan comes by and says, God is an arbitrary tyrant, exacting, unforgiving, and severe. And like children, we think, well, maybe so. We're really not settled into the truth. Tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the cunning of men, by their craftiness in deceitful wiles. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. And there we have unity again. So there's another way of saying God's goal for us is that though it's very sweet to be reborn, have new hearts and right spirits, don't be retarded. I mean, grow up without delay. And come to the place where I can just turn you loose in my universe, knowing you will behave like mature people. And there'll be a unity inherent in the fact that we all love and trust each other. I can even trust you. So many places in the Bible describe, it seems to me, this quality of life that God wants and is the only way to have peace and harmony and unity and freedom for eternity. Do you know any other way to have freedom? forever than this. Now, do the Ten Commandments limit our freedom? Love for God and love for each other. And the Tenth Commandment says, and this means real love, it means that inside you mean it. You're not faking it. No hypocrisy here. No pretentious piety. You not only behave well, you don't even want to behave badly, says the Tenth. But you see, our most sensitive Christian friends will say, we agree with you in all of this. There's just that one ceremonial requirement, the Seventh-day Sabbath. And since, I believe, it has been so misunderstood through the years and has been a wall of hostility and has been a mark of, of the most extreme legalism, I think there's, there's no more serious example of the abuse of something God has given us than was demonstrated on Crucifixion Friday again. I mean, that's why they were so concerned to get him buried before the sun went down. Their Lord and Savior, who'd come to talk to them about freedom and peace and love, they hated him, they said he had a devil, and they killed him, and then spent the next 24 hours singing the praises of their Lord and Savior. It makes, it's insane. And that's what a misunderstanding of God's will can do to us. No wonder Ellen White says the central issue in the great controversy is God's law. That doesn't mean are you going to obey it or not. No, it's do you understand why God would make such use of law? And this was clarified at the cross. Did the angels need a clarification of God's use of law and the quality of life that he wants in his universe? Did the loyal ones need understanding? Is that conceivable? The loyal ones. Well, how could the cross make peace? among the angels even. I mean, the ones who hadn't rebelled. Ellen White makes a stunning statement in this regard, but it certainly invites our, our wondering about what the cross did to the whole family. And she wrote, it's in Signs of the Times, December 30, 1889, which seems so significant to me, for us Adventists who know about that Minneapolis General Conference that debated righteousness by faith at such length, she, that she would say this within a few months afterwards. 
That which alone can effectually restrain from sin, that is, hostility, disunity, breach of trust, and all the rest, in this world of darkness will prevent sin in heaven. The significance of the death of Christ will be seen by saints and angels. The angels ascribe honor and glory to Christ, for even they are not secure except by looking to the sufferings of the Son of God. It is through the efficacy of the cross that the angels of heaven are guarded from apostasy. Without the cross, they would be no more secure against evil than were the angels before the fall of Satan. Angelic perfection failed in heaven, as Revelation 12. But the plan of salvation, making manifest the justice and love of God, provides an eternal safeguard against defection in unfallen worlds, as well as among those who shall be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Then you could say, she's saying, that Christ died for the sinless angels too. And they didn't need any forgiveness. They had not rebelled. But it's as if something was clearer to them after the cross than was before. And what they learned at the cross would protect them from apostasy and defection and sin. Now what is clarified at the cross that protects us from apostasy, defection and sin? Remember, sin is rebelliousness, 1 John 3, 4. Sin is distrust and so on. Well, how would the cross do that? Well, does the cross say, I mean it when I say if you break the rules, I'll kill you as I've killed my son. So take me seriously. Now, does that breed unity? Didn't Paul, when he thought the Ten Commandments, talk to him that way? Until he had the correct picture of God, that Tenth Commandment infuriated him, and he says, sin revived. When I read that tenth one, which says, look, you've been getting off pretty well so far. Let me tell you, if you even want to sin, I'll kill you. Like reading in Isaiah, uh, if you call the Sabbath a delight, if you don't enjoy it, I'll kill you. Right? Oh, that would be infuriating if that's true, wouldn't it? Now, how did the death of Christ eliminate the danger Protect the angels against the hazards of apostasy, defection, hostility, alienation, disunity, distrust. What did they learn at the cross? It's the victory of God, the power of God. Oh, Is it God's power that holds the universe together? It's, it's, he loves us, that yeah. he has a power. Yeah. And um, this is what, the, what it all started at the beginning, was all the power. Can, can, you, can you produce unity through the exercise of power? I mean, it's, it's a, uh, from the cross that, that uh, my understanding is that from the cross that God gives us as individuals the power. What kind of power is that? It's an inward power. It's, um, it's a, of the fruits. Well, let's say here are two hostile people and Christ comes to them and they're enemies. He has the power to make them friends, right? You mean that no, neither one of them could turn him down? In the unity of Jesus Christ. How, how did God lose one third of the angels if he has the power to keep them together? Well, he gave man, he gave, well, my understanding, he gave man his free will. It is resistible power then, isn't it? Right. We can resist it. We can, and, and it's for us to choose. Well, then, since the power can be resisted, what is it about the cross that leads me not to want to resist? Because you love God. I mean, it's, it's you, you... Well, how does the cross lead me to want to love God? You want to live... Well, I think all mankind is yeah. in a debility. You want to live forever, don't we? we? Nobody really wants to... But how would looking at the cross make me want to love God? How would his dying on the cross lead me to love God? The death on the cross was almost the exact opposite of power. Yeah. It was a giving up. And that uh, it showed what the true wages of sin really are. Yeah. And that... Uh, Christ did not die at the hand of God. That, uh, as a matter of fact, Christ died because God had to give him up. And it's almost an exact opposite of the concept of power. In that, uh, it, it's the opposite of force. It's Supposing God establishes his power and convinces us all that he is infinitely powerful. And that makes us afraid. And he says, I want unity and good behavior in the family. And so we do cooperate. Is that worth much? 
Now, the tendency in all religions is to be afraid of God. Isn't that why he's offered so many things to win his favor and appease his anger? And why in Colossians and Ephesians and elsewhere were they doing all these things? Was it not they understood that God required it? Taste not, touch not, handle not, all the rest. You better do it. You better do it. You better be circumcised. You better keep the Sabbath. But they weren't doing it for the right reason. It was the obedience that springs from law, which is often the obedience that springs from fear. Can you really have unity and peace and harmony in the family? This unity that's inherent in our faith and our knowledge of the Son of God. Can you have that when we're all afraid? Must not fear be eliminated? Now, how does the cross eliminate fear? Yes. Uh, for 4,000 years of Bible history, we've got nothing but death, 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 yes. all the way along the road. Yeah. And this seems to be God's wrath. And we've been reading about God's anger toward his people and yes. toward us. And, and this is why I think God has been accused because of all this death. Yeah. Now, Christ comes and goes on the cross. And we are told this is God's plan to raise those people out of the ground to beat death at his own game. This is God in his full majesty, his yeah. full power, his full love, everything going. Yeah. This is it, right at the cross. All the wrath has been removed. Yeah. I see God now as a very loving, yeah. considerate person who saved me the only way I know how to be saved. Yeah. Now, everybody could speak to this, I know. And, and we all should be able to, and there would all, all be slightly different versions, and yet all talking about the same magnificent thing. In the light of the books for tonight, and the one last time, all about law, does the cross tell us something about law, and the God who has used law so much, and what the real violation of law is, and why he says now that you understand this, and why I've given you all these laws? You shouldn't go around condemning people who don't keep them. For example, if we are convinced that heavy smoking can well uh, produce lung cancer, should we go around condemning smokers? I mean, why condemn them? They're losing. Why condemn them for it? If the Seventh-day Sabbath was given to remind us of the truth that is the basis of our faith and um, it's really a, a monument to freedom, if, as we sometimes describe the Sabbath, is that's true, should we go around condemning people who don't keep the Sabbath? No, they're losing something that's very beneficial. Why would you condemn them? Or a man who isn't eating right and is reaping the consequences, why condemn him? I don't find doctors condemning their patients. They try to help them. And I think that's the realization when we realize that all the commands that God has ever given were designed for our best good because we needed them. Now, he wished we didn't need them. So he's given us all these things to help us. When people don't keep those commandments, should we condemn them? They're losing out on the benefits of all these things. And God says, I don't condemn them, but they're missing all this help. This all. And so, see, sin is not the violation of an arbitrary rule. Sin is a, is a breach of trust, that comes from failing to allow the spirit of truth to convince us of what God is like and then being honest with it. God is like not only a physician but a father. And because of our predicament, he's even had to tell us, don't hate people. That's a terrible thing to have to tell you. To. Even say, and please don't kill people. Please. It's, could you agree with me? I mean, I want all the murdering and the adultery and the immorality and cheating and stealing to stop. We were all in a pretty sorry mess when he had to talk like that. But that wasn't even enough. He had to spell it out in tiny detail. But it's only because he wanted to help us. When people are unwilling to accept God's assistance, should we condemn them? Are they losing out already anyway? So I think the relief at the cross is to, um, it's the relief from condemning other people. The, the one who knows this much about God and has been able to make sense out of all his instructions and realizes God values nothing higher than our freedom and apologizes for all these rules, it's just that we needed them. When somebody is not leave, leading a life that will lead to eternal life and all the rest, why condemn the man who isn't going to have any more than five more years in this life? Why condemn him? It brings great freedom and that's why the, the picture of the healer, the physician, is the most eloquent picture possible 
and I believe is why we were led by someone who understood this larger view as a church to get involved in the practice of the healing arts. Doctors don't condemn their patients. They may have earnest words with them, you know, and may have to write it down on paper, do it now, 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 now. You know, if, if, uh, if they, uh, and maybe have to phone them up and remind them. May have to warn them, may have to show pictures of the awful results of being careless in this regard. Yes, that's what the cross is. It's a terrible picture of the awful consequences of persisting in a rebellious, unloving, untrustworthy way of life. Jesus was made to be sin, though he knew no sin, and that's how God's children will die. And he'll give them up. What else can he do? They've refused his help. Then we look at all his laws in an entirely new light. They're not a threat to our freedom at all. We see the purpose of them all. We can even see why he added circumcision and why we don't do it for ceremonial reasons anymore. But then we finally wind up with the Sabbath. It's interesting. The Sabbath is the one so readily misunderstood and yet the one that has the greatest meanings, it seems to me. Because the Sabbath comes along to remind us of all the occasions when God cleared these matters up. Like in, in Creation Week. Look at all he said about himself during Creation Week. Unselfishly sharing his creative power with us and endowing us with the ability to create little people in our own image. That's one of the most eloquent things he did. Giving us freedom there in the garden. Allowing Satan to approach them but protecting Adam and Eve from being overwhelmed by their wily foe, all those things during creation week. Then later on when we lost our freedom, he rescued us from Egyptian bondage and says, now keep the Sabbath to remember the Exodus when I set you free. And then crucifixion week, when the most important answers were given on crucifixion Friday and the next day was Sabbath. He could have gone to heaven Friday afternoon. He didn't. According to the law, he rested on the Sabbath, but he couldn't wait long afterwards. He arose a great while before it was day and went to heaven. To hear the angels say, we understand now. We understand. You're not the least bit arbitrary. We understand all this business of law. It is no um, uh, threat to our freedom, whatever. And that for you to exercise your almighty power to bring unity is not the best way. The way you've chosen to do it is the best way. Have you read Alan White's comment on why the angels needed it? Oh, I must read it to you. If I can put my finger right on it. Yes, look here. This is in the Review and Herald reprints, July 17, 1900. It begins, a crisis arrived in the government of God among the angels, the loyal angels, she says. Now you'd want to read the whole context for this. All heaven was prepared at the word of God to move to the help of his elect. And if you read the preceding paragraph, she's talking about the period after the Exodus. In fact, I almost need to read the preceding one. For centuries, God looked with patience and forbearance upon the cruel treatment given to his ambassadors and his holy law prostrate, despised, and trampled underfoot. He swept away the inhabitants of the Noachian world with a flood. But when the earth was again peopled, men drew away from God and renewed their hostility to him, manifesting bold defiance. Even those whom God rescued from Egyptian bondage, who were after the Exodus now, followed in the footsteps of those who had preceded them. Cause was followed by effect. The earth was being corrupted. Would you nominate the book of Judges maybe for the all-time low there? A crisis arrived in the government of God. The loyal angels wondered what was the best thing to do. Well, he drowned all but eight once. Didn't work. Maybe there's another way. You see, the flood did not work. Did it? The thunderings from Sinai didn't work. I mean, God cannot force unity in the family. But, even now, all heaven was prepared at the word of God to move to the help of his elect. Because there were some saints in the days of the judges. Remember, Ruth follows right after judges. There were wonderful people like Ruth and Boaz and Naomi and others. One word from him and the bolts of heaven would have fallen upon the earth, filling it with fire and flame. God had but to speak, and there would have been thunderings and lightnings and earthquakes and destruction. The heavenly intelligences were prepared for a fearful manifestation of almighty power. Every move was watched with intense anxiety. The exercise of justice was expected. That's the way to handle disunity in the family. The angels looked for God to punish the inhabitants of the earth. 
But the heavenly universe was amazed at what God chose to do. And what follows is John 3.16. Instead, he sent his son to bring us the truth. And particularly at the cross, he answered the great questions about God. And one of the things he answered was the one he answered on the cross that was not answered in Gethsemane. In Gethsemane, yes, death is the result of sin, but it is not at the hands of, our, of a vengeful God. God did not lay a hand on his son. But on the cross, people did lay hands on him. People who pictured God as powerful and authoritarian and exacting and severe. And they were Sabbath keepers, tithe payers, health reformers, Bible believers. Why? Because God has said it and they believed it and that was all there was to it. And they saw nothing wrong in the use of force when disunity came into Judaism and Christians began. Paul thought, saying and doing things that were dividing Judaism, he went out to restore unity in Judaism. And how did he do it in Acts 26? He arrested these Christians. He punished them. He put them in prison and he consented to their death. When Stephen said words before the Sanhedrin that seemed to be a threat to unity, how did those Sabbath-keeping saints seek to keep unity? They stoned him to death. They saw nothing wrong with that use of force. It was to them justice. In the name of God, Paul went out to keep unity in the church. That's been very popular through the years. Hundreds of thousands have been tortured to death at the stake to keep unity in the Christian church. Does, has it worked? You cannot force trust and love. It just can't be done. It's the very antithesis of freedom. And Jesus cleared that all up and the angels realized that that's the truth. And that's the greatest protection against hostility and disunity and apostasy and, de and defection in the hereafter. There is not one streak of arbitrariness in our God. He is not exacting, vengeful, and severe. But it does mean that since he'd rather give his life than give up freedom. Remember, Paul says, if even an angel should disagree with me on this, he's wrong. If even an angel from heaven should come, he's wrong. God says, that's right. I absolutely will never budge on this. I will run my universe in this manner. Therefore, I can only save people who can be entrusted with this kind of freedom. People who also, who all together, love, trust, and admire this kind of God. That's the unity inherent in our faith and our knowledge of the Son of God. So I believe that God's people, wherever they are on this planet, in whatever church or no church, or wherever they are in the universe, God's church, his true people, are those individuals who in the highest sense of freedom have decided that they love, trust, and admire that kind of a God. And then there is a unity among them, no matter what happens. And that unity will last forever. Because it wasn't contrived in the first place. It wasn't forced in the first place. Boy, are you willing to let God run his universe this way? Well, the only safe way is... If he says, I, I weep over this, but I cannot let any of you into this kind of society who cannot be trusted. And you say, well, I've been forgiven, haven't I? What's forgiveness got to do with it? Where do we get so preoccupied with forgiveness? We're preoccupied with forgiveness if our understanding is God says, you break my rules, justice demands I kill you. But I give you a chance, accept this and I'll forgive you. And I say, please, I accept this and I'm forgiven. Good, now you won't have to kill me. Oh, that may be for little children, but it's not for adults. And you can't turn people like that free in a free universe. That conception of God and that preoccupation with forgiveness does not indicate a readiness at all. Our preoccupation should be with whether or not we really are safe to save. I mean, could we really be trusted? And so David says, I've tried everything all my life. I've, I've killed lots of animals. Remember when he brought the ark back? Lots of sacrifices. He says, I realize now if I sacrifice my own son, it would have nothing to do with what needs to be done. I realize now that what you want is truth in the inner man. Please give me a new heart and a right spirit. Now some say, yeah, but Paul cleared this all up and said, what you need most is forgiveness. No, I don't see that at all. I see Paul agreeing with Jesus in his words to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, unless you be forgiven, no, unless you be born again, you'll not see the kingdom. That's all there's to it. 
Now, I think that the message of forgiveness is only part of the revelation of the truth about God. The truth about forgiveness is that God is forgiveness personified. God doesn't forgive us in response to an adequate speech of repentance and confession. And that's why Jesus told the prodigal son story. When did the father forgive the prodigal son? Even as he helped him pack his bags to leave. And the greatest discovery the prodigal son made was, halfway through his speech of repentance, that his father had long since forgiven him. The message of forgiveness is simply part of the revelation of the truth about God. Now, how do we respond to that? Do we allow the same spirit that helped us see this truth, the same spirit that inspired some of our fellow believers to write this all out, then to bring conviction to us of this truth? And that's a new heart and a right spirit. Now, that brings up a verse right here in 4.30 of Ephesians. Ephesians 4.30. And don't you love the way this is put? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, in whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't grieve him. Does that mean don't make him angry and then he won't help you? Or is it that when we do not allow our Heavenly Father to heal us, he grieves? Because then he'll have to give us up. Now, supposing I do whatever it is that brings great sorrow to the Spirit of God. What am I actually doing? I mean, God is not willing that any should be lost but that all should be one to repentance. By the way, what wins us to repentance? Romans 2, 4. But the kindness of God, which is the truth about God, you see. Who brings us the truth? Where's all the evidence about the kindness of God? Isn't it the, the uh, inspired scripture, which holy men of God were moved by the Holy Ghost to write? The Spirit does all this for us. Do not disappoint him in the work that he seeks to do. What work does he seek to do? You remember Christ's long prayer that was in our Sabbath school lesson last week? It's really 13 through 17. I will not leave you orphans. When I go, I will send another counselor and teacher like myself. He'll do the same, same work I've been trying to do. He's a spirit of truth who will guide you into truth, convince you of the truth. And when you're convinced of the truth and say, Lord, I love and trust you, you couldn't do that without a new heart and a right spirit. So it's already happened. So the resistance of the truth about God is really the effective resistance of the Holy Spirit, isn't it? And if I persist in resisting the truth, eventually I even come to a place where the lies make more sense to me than the truth. I prefer Satan's lies to the truth. Romans 1 says, what does God do to those who prefer the lies to the truth? He gives them up. And he weeps over them. How can I give you up? How can I let you go? And it all fits in there, it seems to me. Now, instead of grieving the Spirit by rejecting this truth about God that would lead me back to trust so he could heal me, 5.18 says, in a most interesting verse, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Does anybody have Phillips here tonight? Do not get your stimulus from wine, for there is always a danger of excessive drinking. But let the Spirit stimulate your souls. No, look at that. Uh, do not get your stimulus from wine where there is danger of excess, but let the Holy Spirit stimulate your souls. It is interesting that through the history of mankind, we have needed some stimulants. Uh, man was never designed to survive on this planet alone. And God, knowing how difficult things would be, had made provision that when we felt depressed, the Spirit would stimulate us. Uh, when there was hostility, the Spirit would bring love. When we were sad, the Spirit would bring joy, love, joy, peace, and that whole long list. But of course, when you're under the influence of this Spirit, this Spirit is stimulating you, it never would lead to a loss of self-control, the last of the fruits of the Spirit, so there's no danger of excess. But man who has not wanted to come under the stimulus of the Spirit of God has still needed stimulus, and he's tried everything under the sun through the years. And one of the most popular methods of finding love, joy, peace, and all these things, has been uh, alcohol, though the ancients didn't know what it was. But when they went to religious services, they got filled with the spirit, and they called it spirit. See, that's why alcohol is called spirits. You go to the spirit shop to get alcohol. Uh, always amuses me when I drive by Yieldy Spirit Shop. It's the same word for the Holy Spirit. And isn't it true when people are depressed, they drink and they feel better? 
when the Russians and the British and the Americans are at the Yalta Conference, and you know, there wasn't the warmest feeling between them all. The cocktails and the vodka flowed, and they had arms around each other, and they made very ridiculous decisions at times. But um, they thought it was love. Of course, truth wasn't there on self-control. But all through the years, people have used artificial stimulants. Now, there's only one group that tries to survive with none. They'd rather die than take artificial stimulants, but they're not stimulated by the Holy Spirit either. They are known as the lukewarm Laodiceans. And God says, I'd rather you were cold uh, than just lukewarm. So you see, what's, what's worse, to be stimulated by an artificial stimulant or stimulated not at all? Well, neither one is a live option, I hope. The only way is to let the Holy Spirit stimulate you. But it does add an interesting thing. When you are stimulated by the Spirit, do you notice what happens? Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, always and for everything giving thanks in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God the Father. Some do feel that dignified Christians lack a little enthusiasm and warmth at times. I believe that one can be the most scholarly in his pursuit of truth and yet be a highly stimulated person. Now, sometimes that's thought to be undignified. You know, scholars are people of great poise and reserve, and they sometimes give a false impression here. I like the thought that nobody was a better scholar than Paul, and he understood these things in the most intricate way, and yet he's most stimulated. And I, I think it's a pity that we couldn't demonstrate the most unimpeachable scholarship in our understanding of these matters, and at the same time come through in a very warm, obviously stimulated manner, and certainly not lukewarm about it. It is not a violation of good scholarship to be enthusiastic about these things. I sometimes wonder if unstimulated scholars really see the truth, or maybe they just feel they have to keep this image of self-control. You see, the spirit that brings self-control is also described here as stirring people to give expression to these matters. Certainly when Jesus spoke, he spoke with tremendous feeling. And there are many other descriptions of biblical writers doing the same. Well, lastly, as it's time to go, in Colossians, do, do you see light uh, just for tonight? I mean, there's many details here we could work on. At least something was clarified at the cross. It did involve a misunderstanding of the law. And if we had this understanding, we'd stop judging and condemning other people. And such rules as taste not, touch not, handle not, we'd agree with Paul, away with them. They're man-made and they're not from God. Is at least that much clear? Does it also suggest that whatever Jesus did at the cross in revealing the truth about God and his law, it should be the end of our trying to win his favor and thus be forgiven and saved because we've done these things so faithfully and well. We haven't tasted, we haven't touched, we haven't handled and so on. And we have kept the Sabbath and we faithfully condemn those who violated the laws and so on. Away with all of that approach. The cross is a revelation of the truth about God and his law. But it also suggests that God is not going to change that law. The law that says this universe runs on love and trust and trustworthiness will never, ever be changed. Or there will be no unity that's worth anything. There'll be no lasting freedom, no lasting peace. So it does suggest the perpetuity of this law. But the clarification of all the abuses of it. A little thing or two at the end. Did you notice Luke is the beloved physician? This is the place where it is, Colossians 4.14. Uh, the beloved doctor was with Paul when he wrote these things and shared these ideas with him. Did you also notice in 4.9, Onesimus the slave is mentioned here. Remember this when you read Philemon. With him, Onesimus, the faithful and beloved brother. That's that former slave. Now, and then do you see Mark? Remember Paul had trouble with Mark and thought he was a sissy and uh, couldn't endure the hardships of the evangelistic itinerary. In 4.10, Mark is there also. Then did you notice in 1, 15 and 18, and closing with this idea, the references to Christ as the firstborn of all creation. 
If the one who came was not really God, then all we've said these Monday nights goes down the drain. You mean he's the firstborn of all creation? Then we don't know about God. Someone very kind was willing to come, or maybe he made him come, to clear up these matters. What do you do with the firstborn of all creation? Firstborn. I'd want to put with that Verse 18, he's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Firstborn, that in everything he might be preeminent. Is that how he's firstborn? Firstborn doesn't mean the first one born necessarily, but the first in position, in rank and in authority. For example, Isaac was Abraham's firstborn, his only begotten son. But he'd had a boy before, hadn't he? But he didn't inherit the estate. So this is in that sense of rank and position. Isn't this whole passage here in Colossians 1 to the effect that the one who came has never had a beginning? He's the first. Uh, he is the creator of all things. And didn't John say the same? Nothing was created without him. And Hebrews 1 is going to say, God told the angels to worship him and you don't worship a created being. And I think that uh, Paul's great concern here in Colossians is that the one who came to clear up all the questions about God was God himself. Or our questions have not really been answered. Because our questions are not about the second in command. They're not about an angel. Our questions are about God. So those who believe that someone less than God came have either different questions well, they don't have the answers. But if we really want to know about God, what God is really like, then it would mean everything in the world to believe and understand that the one who came to this earth and walked among us was that God. And so, when Jesus was here, and we realize it's God, and you watch him treat sinners so graciously, did anybody intercede with Jesus to forgive somebody. No. Nobody had to plead with him to forgive. Ever. It was in his heart to forgive. No one had to plead with him. But somebody has to plead with the Father, right? If Jesus is fully God, as emphasized in all these passages, and nobody had to intercede with him, then we know no one has to intercede with God. And yet they weren't getting that point. And so Jesus had to say in John 16, 26, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And you realize the implications of this? There's no need for me to intercede with the Father when I get up there. But the Father's just like me. In fact, I am God. What about Isaiah 9? What are the names of the Son? But the everlasting Father, the Almighty God. Remember? So on this earth, the angels saw God than, him, than, than whom there is none greater treating people the way he did. And nobody had to plead with Jesus to forgive. So if, if we suggest someone needs to plead with the Father but not with the Son, we've driven a wedge between the two, or we suggest maybe the Son is not fully God. Whatever God did to sinners, I mean God the Son, God the Father would do, for they are equally God. Do, do you have a question about that? The implications of it are simply tremendous. For ending with this, we say we have a friend up there. Do not be afraid of the judgment, for we have a friend in court. I just read it again today in a magazine. Who is our friend? Jesus? You see, the implication of that is that the Father is not our friend. But if you say God is our friend, who is God? The Father? The Son? Or the Holy Spirit. And if we should wonder how the Holy Spirit feels, we're told in Romans 8, you remember, that he too intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. Truly, all three members of the Godhead are on our side. How important to realize it was God who was here on this planet. And Jesus said in John 12 and 14 both, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. If you trust me, you trust the Father. And the incredible thing is, that that gentle person who walked around Palestine the way he did and was so incredibly gracious even to the one who would betray him at the end, that he was fully God 
And that's the way God treats people. And don't wonder if the one up there is still learning how to behave as graciously as the sun. That's a terrible thing to think about. And yet, do you have the feeling that when we um, arise in the hereafter, it might be best to meet the Son first? Would there not be some risk in meeting the Father first? Should not the Son escort us, I mean our friend escort us, into the presence of the Father? If we ran into the Father first, that would be risky. Then we still have not really accepted Either the testimony of Jesus, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and he loves you as much as I do, or worse, we have not recognized that the one who came was God. So this larger view of the plan of salvation exalts Christ. It couldn't exalt him any higher. It believes that the one who came to this earth was really God, fully God, and how incredibly he treated people, even people he knew would never be one. He washed Judas' dirty feet and he covered for him. When he went out to betray him, they thought he'd gone to make an offering to feed the poor. And that's the way he is. And he didn't kill Judas. Judas went out and committed suicide. And Jesus wept as he saw him go. And that's God. And I think we still have work to do to bring the two together and really accept the fact that the whole Bible reveals the Father just as clearly as the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that's tremendous good news. And if God runs his universe the way Jesus ran things in Palestine for three and a half years, then truly God does not want to raise his voice again. But that doesn't work if you've got a lot of unbelieving sinners around. Because when God was here for those three and a half years, he did not raise his voice. He was so gracious and so winsome and so forgiving and so generous, and he was not respected. And he did not produce good behavior because he didn't exercise that incredibly gracious form of government over people who respected that kind of government. And what that demonstrates is that we Adventists might be so bright and proper in keeping all the rules of the blueprint. And yet when we're introduced into that kind of society, we behave just the way the unbelieving Jews did. You see, when he tried to be so gracious and winsome, he wasn't having to straighten them out on, on their diet. They all ate kosher. And on their tithe paying, they all paid two and a half tithe. Or on their health reform, they strained gnats out of their goat's milk. Or on which day was the Sabbath. Or they should believe the Bible, the Ten Commandments, creation, you name it. They believed the whole lot. And yet they had no respect for his form of government. If he had thundered a little more, if he'd said, yes, take that woman in adultery out and stone her, they'd go, now you're talking, now you're talking, that's good leadership. And it wasn't. But the angels had to learn that too. The question is, in all our concern to do the right and proper thing, are we really people who have unreserved respect for this kind of government? Or could we even be trusted under this kind of government? That's why I like to make the statement that I believe God is an infinitely powerful but equally gracious person who values nothing higher than the freedom and the dignity and the individuality of his intelligent creatures that their love, their faith, their worship, their willingness to listen and obey may be freely given. Of course, there is no freedom without order and self-discipline without mutual love and trust. If I choose to be disorderly, unloving and untrustworthy, I will begin to lose my freedom and reap all kinds of undesirable consequences, both in this life and most terribly in the end, but not at the hands of our gracious God. His cry over his disorderly, untrusting children will be, why will you die? How can I give you up? How can I let you go? For untrusting children will not be healed. They cannot be trusted in that kind of a universe. He will give them up and they will die as Jesus died when he was given up. And as God wept over his son, he weep over us. Then how could one resist this? Grieve not the Holy Spirit who brings us this picture and says, do you like it? And I can't make you like it any more than I can make you enjoy the Sabbath. And how dare you reread that passage in Isaiah saying, you've got to keep the Sabbath and you've got to enjoy it. 
I mean, what an awful picture of God, you know. And if people disagree with you on the Sabbath, which is given to be a blessing, you may condemn them. Would he talk that way? Jesus never did. There's only one thing that really stirred him. That's when some of those, those pretentiously pious people listened to him say these incredible things, like, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They said, do we not say correctly that you have a devil to picture God like this? That's Satan's picture of God, they were saying. Oh, he said, you, my people, the Bible teaches among my people, and you have the Old Testament in your hands when you say that. I very rarely speak to you like this, but I have to tell you, you are of your father the devil, and you prefer his lies to the truth. And even then, Ellen White says, there were tears in his voice, but he had to say it. And I believe in the world today there are many who say, this weak, sentimental picture of God is not enough. You'll never hold the universe together that way. Some stronger words than that are used. Often these are people who are very determined to be saved and very much preoccupied with forgiveness and the adjustment of their legal standing in the presence of a God who is bound by justice to kill his wayward children. That is another picture of God. And yet, I can leave room for that. It just means your tent is still pitched at the foot of Sinai and you're serving him out of fear. And God would love us to go up that mountain to the cave where he says, I'd much rather speak to you in the still small voice. But some of you don't respect that, so I can't talk to you that softly yet. When you grow up someday and act maturely, as Ephesians says, I'll only have to whisper. In fact, I won't have to tell you these things. You'll do what's right because it is right. Then once again, we really have unity, harmony, and peace in the family. And that's what it's all about. And I love it. Should we pause before we go? Our loving Father in heaven, when we consider the incredible ideal, the way thou art determined to run the family for all eternity, we wonder if we could ever fit in, if we could ever be trusted, because we so often find within ourselves the lingering consequences of our former misbehavior and maybe years of distrust or vacillating trust one day and then not another. And yet we realize thou hast told us to regard ourselves as not only thy children but thy patients, and thou art our physician. Thou dost understand our condi condition. It takes a while to heal the damage done. And yet we see in Scripture the promise of some great change when we're won back to love, trust, and admiration for so wonderful a Heavenly Father this thing that's called a new heart and a right spirit, a love for what we once despised, a willingness to listen to something we treated even with disrespect or with carelessness before. So we pray that all of us may have allowed the spirit of truth to lead us to understanding of the truth, to conviction about the truth, and to love, trust, and admiration for the one about whom all this is so true. And we realize that if tonight we die, thy trusting children, thy trusting patience, we will arise, thy trusting children and patience. And whatever needs to be done, thou art well able to do. At least may we be sure tonight that we can say, and it could be said of us before the heavenly council, that we are children who still need help, but children who honestly trust thee and trust thee enough to be willing to listen and let thee heal all the damage done. So we rejoice that as we look at these things, we are stirred to love, to admiration, and a greater willingness to listen. We thank thee for this, for we know it is evidence that the healing is underway, and that someday we could actually be admitted to this kind of society where everyone can be trusted, and everyone can trust everybody else. No prisons, no jails, no police, no rules printed on the walls where we all do what's right because we agree it is right. And never more will we need to be told to stop hating and cheating and stealing and lying and killing each other even because nobody wants to do any such thing. Surely highest than the highest human thought can reach is thy ideal for us. 
for we know thou art also infinitely powerful and well able to heal us if we're willing to trust thee and let thee do what needs to be done. Surely this is a very personal matter. May each one of us